Middlebury undergrad, correct? The university, I'm doing it from memory, Doc. The University of Rhode Island Medical School. Rochester. Red, Rochester, sorry, yeah. Rochester. Very cool. Are, and, um, and you did your residency at Lennox Health and you did a sports medicine fel fellowship with Jim Pacey, Dr. Pacey down at Jimmy Andrews place, AS, ASMI. That's correct, yeah. Pretty, Pretty good, Tim. Not bad, not bad. <laughs> yes, I've been in the I've been in the OR with Doctor Bedford for quite some time, and uh, that's kind of one of the reasons that I wanted to go um, go over the evolution of Achilles tendon repair from when he started as a resident to where we are now, because it's really changed a lot. But I think that first, before we start talking about repairing Achilles, we should be talking about the history of Achilles tendon ruptures and who gets them, and what ages, and what sports. And what predisposing factors? Um, who does get Achilles tendon ruptures, Doctor Bedford? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. This will be fun. Um, the uh, Achilles tendon ruptures, uh, you know, have been around for a long time. You're about the Achilles heel and uh, things like that. We we've known for a long time that Achilles ruptures are are bad injuries. They're tough to get your mobility back, um, and they remain pretty bad injuries. It's uh, injuries that take a long time to get back, no matter how we treat them. Uh, but no, Achilles tendon ruptures we see uh, happen predominantly in males, you know, four or five times as likely to happen in males than females. Um, in middle age, 30s, 40s, um, the, although I have to say, you know, in, in my practice, we're starting to see that widen a little bit. I'm seeing more younger patients with Achilles ruptures. Maybe it's uh, more cycles of activity or more practices or more, more overload. We're also seeing a, a subgroup of older patients who we didn't see uh, so much, uh, probably the last five years or so, um, that I think, uh, we have some older people, you know, 50, 60s that are, that are a lot more active than they used to be. I think, uh, one of the things that sprung up everywhere, pickleball, we hear about that a lot. So that's one of the things Achilles new, uh, pickleball injury. And I think with that, a little bit older demographic, uh, at least we're seeing patients and, and maybe including some more female athletes as well. Uh, a little, little skewed. I'm not sure what you've seen in the in the PT clinic if that correlates at all. It does. It does correlate. It's mostly explosive athletes. I think that it's athletes who who um, have a lot of size, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe steroid use possibly has something to do with it. If the muscle is too big for the tendon, maybe it overloads the tendon and pops. Maybe it's mm -hmm. degenerative. I'm not sure if the literature really bears that out. Whether degenerative tendons go on to rupture or not. Um, but certainly, uh, even, even, uh, medicines can help contribute to that in the lay population. I remember a big, uh, a big craze was the Cipro drug that, sure. uh, yeah. You tell us about that. yeah, so fluoroquinolone antibiotics, Cipro being one, Levaquin, um, certainly uh, there's an increase in Achilles ruptures. Uh, most importantly, if you're taking that with the corticosteroid, it really increases your risk. If you think about the. The overall risk we take Cipro, there's about a 0.2% incidence of Achilles rupture, which sounds pretty low. But when you think about it, that's huge compared to the population where, you know, 15 out of 100,000 might get an Achilles rupture. Um, so I think we don't completely understand that. There's some decreased uh, tenocyte uh, prol proliferation when you're on those, um, but it can happen pretty quickly. Um, you can be on it and, and uh, have a pretty quick uh, a problem, but there's some uh, disorder of collagen uh, function that it that it uh, contributes to. What about uh, what about the Achilles? What about the cortisone injection into the Achilles tendon? Is that yeah. a predisposing factor for yeah. those people that might do that? Yeah. So corticosteroids in general, systemically, certainly, but yeah, you know, corticosteroid right in the tendon uh, can certainly decrease uh, tendon strength and something we want to want to try to avoid um you know i think we mentioned tendinopathy and and achilles pain uh predispo as a predisposing factor i think there's some inconsistency with the literature as to how much uh, of a predisposing fa factor um achilles tendinopathy is uh you know some studies say you know three or four percent of people with tendinopathy lead to ruptures others far lower than that um but yeah we want to avoid corticosteroid injections uh around the achilles certainly um you know, I think we see these uh, these ruptures in, in patients uh, that are intermittently athletic. So going back to play basketball in your rec league when you haven't done it for a while or seasonal athletes where they've taken six or nine months off and then 
they go and these weekend warriors where they're they're playing at a hard level but very intermittently so their muscles and tendons aren't conditioned quite the same way is one of the, the big uh, risk factors we see yeah it's exactly what we see also but once once someone tears their achilles tendon is making the diagnosis hard how do you make that diagnosis i mean the patient comes into us or and says oh i felt like i got shot in the calf yeah what? that's the that's the most common story shot in the calf kicked in the calf i had a patient that told me they were so sure they got kicked they he towards achilles running for the subway he was so sure somebody kicked him he turned around and shoved the guy behind him and got in a little scuffle in the fight <laughs> behind him because and then, you know didn't didn't happen that way unfortunately but uh survived the fight part of it but no i think that's the that's the most common thing a, a pop a snap it's it's an audible pop sometimes it, you know, your friend playing squash with you could could hear it pop but it happens with this forceful sudden dorsiflexion of a fixed plantar flexed foot so that that what that means is you know, think about going to change direction quickly or backpedaling and then going forward or landing from a jump it's an explosive event you know that really loads you know 10 times your body weight through the achilles and uh it's not a not a subtle event um you know so i think the uh the the history does a lot there you say hey i felt the pop somebody shot me in the back of the leg doesn't mean they have an achilles but uh but certainly you know throws up your your radar a little bit could be plantaris right there you go yeah so we see plantaris ruptures they they can uh give you that same snap pop um uh feeling and an idea um, the difference there is we're not going to feel that palpable gap on the Achilles. So most Achilles ruptures, or many of them, you can feel a palpable gap. The most common place the Achilles ruptures is three or four centimeters above the calcaneus or the heel um, in a watershed area where the blood supply is not quite as good. So that's one of the things that we're looking for. You can feel a pop with a, with a calf strain. Uh, so the pop itself doesn't mean Achilles, but it should should say, hey, get into the clinic and do your therapist or doc and, and be evaluated. Um, and uh, so if they have low Achilles pain and a pop, even more so, um, you know, if you have just uh, upper calf pain, less likely. And then we do something called the Thompson test. And you guys do as well, I think, uh, right? Mm -hmm. So Thompson test, probably familiar with, but that's uh, essentially a calf squeeze and the absence of plantar flexion with a, with a squeeze of the calf. So ideally it's done with the patient prone uh, so you can take gravity away and, and see what the uh, function is and compare to the other side. Um, but that's a, you know, pop, palpation defect, Thompson test. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good clinical diagnosis uh, right there. Would you get an MRI in these folks, doc? So I generally don't. Um, I think the role of MRI for my practice is if uh, you're concerned about a partial tear, maybe they had some of those symptoms, but you don't feel the gap, or they still have um, some plantar flexion with a Thompson test and think something's off, I think it's helpful. Um, I would also get an MRI in a situation where you're about a really high tear, so a muscular tendinous junction tear uh, that, uh, you know, think that a positive Thompson test and say, hey, can, can we go in and fix this thing? Uh, you know, where is it within the tendon? I think it's helpful mm -hmm. there. And then finally, in the patients with the more chronic injury that uh, you know, we see that you know might be weeks or months out from the injury, say, you know, what's the what's the gap? What are the what's the muscle look like? Is this repairable? Do we need you know something uh, further tendon transfer, or something else? Um, so I think those are the patients. I think a lot of a lot of patients come in wanting an MRI. It's New York. Everybody wants an MRI. They want that that look at it and the, and the diagnosis. So, um, you know, not, not opposed to getting an MRI, but clinically, I'm not sure it's necessary in most of our patients. Mm -hmm. um, I, do, I do some ultrasounds in the office for the Achilles. I think uh, that's a quick, cheap in-office test. We can look right there with the patient, show them the, the gap, show them the ends of the tendon, show them how it moves, um, localize a little bit. We can uh, make sure we're comfortable with the location of the tear if we're thinking about fixing it or talking about non-operative management. So I think ultrasound in the office may be, uh, may be a good alternative uh, to, to MRI in a lot of these patients. Let's talk about fixing it or not fixing it. That's a, some, I mean, that's, that's a little bit of a controversial subject nowadays because there's some good literature out there by Waddle at all in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2007. Then there was a My Myovid, uh, Myovid article in New England Journal of Medicine just two years ago that showed good results in a randomized controlled study on op versus non op. 
Um, what is your opinion? Do you think that everyone needs to be fixed? Does it not? I mean, what's yeah. your what's your whole philosophy on that? So I think certainly there's not a one size fits all approach with Achilles ruptures. Um, you know, the if we're talking about the uh, most common mid substance full thickness Achilles rupture, that's where the debate comes in. Do we fix it or not? I think we have to take a step back and understand the goals. The goal with Achilles really is to get the restore the length tension ratio to the tendon um, to be able to build up the uh, muscular strength around the uh, calf muscles and get the, get the patient back to their desired level of activity. So if you have a young elite professional athlete right now, the, the, the trend is towards fixing. If you have an older patient with a lot of comorbidities, diabetes, vascular disease, it's a pretty easy nana. So most of the patients we see are what we just talked about, these weekend warriors in their 30s and 40s. And they're, they're patients that really could go either way. Um, so I think the studies that you mentioned uh, are you know, level one randomized controlled trials telling us that, hey, non-operative works and it, uh, and it does work. Um, I think the considerations that we need to think about are non-operative works a lot better now that we're using more advanced rehab protocols. So protocols that involve getting the tendon back together. So the earlier we get back uh, into a plantar flex or an aquinas position, uh, the better the results are. We don't always see these patients right away. So a few weeks out may not be as good as you know, two days after the injury. Um, but I think uh, now we understand that uh, early weight bearing helps the tendon realign its collagen fibers. Um, helps it uh, regain its elasticity. So if we're doing that type of protocol, which these, uh, these newer articles uh, now uh, compare, we know that the, uh, the rate of healing is essentially equivalent. Um, there's a decreased rate of limb complications, nerve injury, over surgery. I think the debate out there that's still there but is the re-rupture rate. Um, and that's something that uh, is still a bit different. Um, now, some studies have shown the re-rupture rate's exactly the same. The 2022 study in the New England Journal that you mentioned is a multi study. Um, and that's one that they, yeah, 10 times higher re-rupture rate still in that study with non-operative treatment. Now it's only yeah. about 6 percent re-rupture rate. So the, the Delta and the percentage isn't that, that big, but it's uh 6% point versus 0.6%, uh, in surgically repaired tendons. Now there's some studies that only show twice the, the re-rupture rate. So that's not everybody, but, uh, but I think that's the biggest concern that, that a lot of surgeons have with non-operative management in those patients. And when I looked into these articles, I noticed that none of these articles really broke down athletes versus lay people. You know, it was kind mm -hmm. of, you're not talking about an NFL football player. You're not talking about a weekend warrior. You're talking about, you know, just, um, just non-athletes versus athletes, you know, yeah. somebody running for the train versus somebody who's playing hoop all the time. So we got to tease that out also, but um, certainly, uh, if it's I a, think that's a that's a hard study to do right now, uh, given the, that that rupture rate. There aren't too many elite professional athletes or elite college athletes that want to have yeah. non-operative treatment, be off their feet for a little bit longer, and and potentially have a higher rupture rate. So I mm -hmm. think uh, you know there's there's some ideas with adding biologics, PRP or BMAC or things like that, perhaps to enhance healing. If we get a little closer, I think those studies will come. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, non-operative uh, is not, not the, uh, certainly not the wrong thing to do. It's well accepted. And in our weekend warrior athletes, that's something to consider. Yes. Um, you used to do the surgery when you started um, as a resident with me open. Yeah. Now you so, switched. I was in the OR with you just uh, a few months ago. And you, you're, you're doing this PARS, uh, PARS repair, which I found fascinating. Um, we're going to talk about a research article in a second that examined the PARS versus the um, open technique. Can you talk about uh, just the evolution of the open technique and what you used to do to what you're doing today, Dr. Bedford? Yeah, so we used to make a big open incision on the medial board of the Achilles to look at both ends of the tendon. And they're like mop ends, you know, spaghetti that were sewn back together. We use uh, heavy-duty core stitches that are non-absorbable tying knots to fix uh, the tendon back together and uh, you know, an epitendinous stitch around it. So we get a biomechanically very, very strong repair. Um, but the, the issue there is there's certainly significant wound healing complications, especially uh, in smokers, people on steroids, 
with the hiring females, but it's not a not a zero. And a wound complication around an Achilles can be a really big deal. The Achilles is, as you know, right under the, the subcutaneous tissue. So if the skin's infected, the Achilles gets infected and can lead to debridements and uh, resection of the Achilles flaps. I mean, really bad things pretty quickly. So um, we need to be really, really careful with that. So uh, PARS is one example of, uh, of a more minimally invasive technique. And essentially, we're making a small couple centimeter incision just to open up at the, uh, at the injured area and not disturbing uh, anything, but going within the peritoneum with essentially a jig that can allow us to percutaneously place sutures through the Achilles. So we can place locking sutures through the Achilles through a very small incision, allowing us to, to not disrupt the soft tissue nearly as much. And that's been able to, to show in some studies decreased wound complications um, and faster skin healing. Um, and that PARS technique uh, has been out there for you know, 10 or 15 years. It's not a brand new thing, but it's uh, been adopted more and more. I think the downside, the main downside of the PARS technique is you're not directly visualizing or protecting the sural nerve. So there is a higher incidence of sural nerve injury. Um, and that uh, as you know, runs right along the lateral border of the Achilles. So that could be a painful neuroma, that could be decreased sensation. Um, in some really studies, it was as high as you know, 25%. Um, it's well below that now, a couple of percent. I think we can protect it um, uh, fairly well. So I think this, this PARS technique is, um, has been adopted, uh, you know, not universally by any means, but started to become adopted more and more. Um, I think the, the other thing that, that's out there along with the PARS technique is something called a speed bridge. So speed bridge is a this is a trademark of a, of a company, Arthrex, that uh, some of us use with uh, make nice anchors. But it can be used for with any um, with any company. But essentially, it's describing a technique. In this case, a mid substance speed bridge, where we're uh, taking those sutures from the top of the Achilles and anchoring them back down into the calcaneus, into the heel bone. Um, and so that uh, that par speed bridge is uh, what some of the athletes have had recently. We all heard about Aaron Rodgers last year. Um, making his uh, early return, perhaps. So that, that early return didn't quite happen, but but he's ready for this year. Um, so that's par speed bridge. The idea is that we're uh, trying to hold the, that length tension relationship and not relying on side to side tendon healing to do that and how fast we stretch it, but actually taking those sutures in the upper end of the tendon and uh, anchoring them to the heel to allow that tendon to tendon, inter tendon, to tendon interface not take all of the load. So the theory behind that being that we should be able to rehab a little bit more aggressively without having to worry quite so much about tendon elongation. Um, and biomechanically, that seems to pan out in early biomechanic studies. There's not a whole lot of you know long-term clinical data to say if that's uh, that's a real effect. Uh, but we use uh, use that type of idea through uh, uh, in other parts of the body, certainly. What if, what if it's a high tear like you were describing earlier? So, so if you have a tear um, in the, sort of up in the muscular tendon junction there, and not all tears are the same, you know. So, mm. how do you determine that? You do ultrasound, MRI. Can you use that technique on that, those types of tears? Yeah. So high tears are a little bit more difficult to treat, um, and the reason they're more difficult, the tissue itself is not quite as good in the upper part where the tendon's becoming fascia or the loose covering over the over the edge of the muscle. It's a lot harder to get a stitch to hold in. Um, so in those, the uh, my experience, the PARS technique where we're not directly visualizing it is very difficult to, to deal with in that situation. Um, that uh, those are ones that we tend to do an open repair if it's low enough that we think there's good enough tissue to get a suture grasp and there's a gap formation there. If there's no gap formation, it's a stretch injury there. There's great blood supply for healing, and I think those patients are reasonably good patients to treat non-operatively and, uh, and and put in our non-op protocol. One of the benefits of the open technique was the type of the type of suture you can use, a Krakow suture. Um, are you getting this same strength in suture repair with the ARS technique? Yeah, so traditionally we use a Krakow or a Benel, some type of uh, woven locking uh, technique. Um, the PARS allows us to have the same strength um, as that. Um, we put multiple sutures and now tape style sutures as well. Um, the tape style meaning that they're flatter so they uh, don't have as much pull through the tendon. Um, so that uh, that's equivalent at this point. Um, and the uh, so the early biomechanics on that are, are quite good. 
Um, I think the uh, the advance there is is the tape uh, lack of pull through of that is one that uh, is a bit of an advantage of what we were doing 15 years ago yeah. with uh, ethylbon sutures or, or large uh, coreless sutures. And certainly the knock stacks and the suture uh, burden on the soft tissue is a lot less with the PARs. I think one of the things we see using a minimally invasive technique where there's less suture material, less passes through, less knots, is that uh, as the tendon heals, there seems to be less uh, bulk of the of the tendon um, at the, its final final stage, a year out. It's less bulky and perhaps more sure. elastic. Um, I'm not sure if you see that in the PT clinic or, or not. Absolutely. Uh, I remember early on, it was always a risk reward between the bowls of tissue in the back of the Achilles tendon or cheese clothing the tendon through the ethabon sutures. You guys used mm -hmm. to struggle with that all the time. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I am familiar with that. Um, before we go any further, let's delve into the, uh, the article that we chose out of the Scientific Journal of, uh, of the Foot and Ankle. And we chose this article just to, it was one of the earliest articles to show the effectiveness of the PARS technique. And the article, the article essentially compared, um, compared the um, functional outcomes of the PARS technique to an open technique. Yeah, so I think... Uh... You know, there, there are a bunch of articles uh, of a similar nature, and this is one example of them that shows that, uh, you know, PARS versus open are essentially equivalent. Um, I think the, the difficulty that uh, we have with uh, some of these minimally invasive techniques is, uh, is not directly visualizing the, uh, the cerebral nerve, uh, so it can be high, higher instance that, but it, it can I mean, it's a trade-off for, uh, you know, few, fewer uh, wound healing complications. But I think it shows that that's a, that's a reasonable uh, thing to do. Um, and there are a number of different uh, minimally invasive techniques now to, to try to accommodate that, that same task. So I think the, uh, the, the switch uh, for a lot of surgeons uh, to, to minimize wound complications has, has certainly happened. Yeah. Do you have similar uh, post-op protocols that they use for the PARS technique in this article? They did a rehabilitation protocol that once they left the uh, surgical center, they were in a plastic, plaster cast, a splint, with the ankle in the equine position. And after seven days, the dressing came off, and they put him in a sort of a, a sort of a cam walker. I think it, it's kind of a saying in the article. And they wean wean the uh, equine position until uh, about six weeks, and then they started putting them in dorsiflexion. Is that similar to what you do? Tell us about your uh, your rehab after the PAR study. Yeah, so I think uh, we try to have use an accelerated rehab process for early loading of the tendon. Um, what that means for me is that we have the patient in an Aquinas splint postoperatively for two weeks to allow for wound healing. So we don't want a lot of Achilles motion um, while the incisions are healing. So we're elevating, we're getting swelling down. Um, at two weeks, we check the incision as long as there's uh, good incisional healing. Um, we transition from that sterile post-operative dressing to a cam boot with a heel lift. Um, and uh, so two weeks out, the patient uh, can start their physical therapy program with progressive loading. Um, we're not stretching the tendon, but we're loading it. Um, and uh, the therapist is helping us at that point monitor the, uh, the soft tissue healing and uh, swelling. Um, so at that two weeks, uh, we slowly start to progress the patient and uh, in subsequent weeks, take out the heel lifts as their motion allows. Um, so essentially, they have two weeks in a splint, usually four weeks in a boot. Um, at the six-week point, we're looking to start to wean the boot into a shoe with a heel lift. So uh, by the time at least they're eight weeks out, they're generally in a normal shoe with a small heel lift um and uh progressively uh working uh towards uh, dorsiflexion but again not stretching the achilles but loading it early or sure. early weight bearing so most of our patients can start weight bearing around the four week point um what do you find in your clinic in terms of weight bearing uh, we have trouble sometimes when the patient's in a lot of aquinas realistically putting weight on it and getting the patient feeling even enough and comfortable enough to, to get anything out of it do you have a any perspective on that yeah, sure. In the in the old days, I remember it used to be you wear cowboy boots or 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 work boots with a big mm -hmm. heel, you know, yeah. so that you wouldn't load that tendon too much, and uh, and then we progress from there to sort of less of a heel. But uh, certainly, certainly we will progress on that uh, with different things in the clinic and different heel inserts uh, 
in, in their shoes and in, in, diff in different footwear that they have, certainly. Um, can be difficult, though, for sure. Yeah, you know, we use uh, have the patients buy something to elevate their shoe on the other side to even it out just for the cam boot. And once we get down to, you know, one or two uh, chunky heel, heel lifts in the cam boot, they can usually start to, to walk reasonably well. I think the, the other thing that we have immediately post-op, we worry a lot about falls. These are, you know, active patients, but uh, they're still going to work. They're trying to get on the subway. They're running around New York. Um, so crutches and uh, and slippery surfaces don't mix so well. So I think that's one of the early things we mm -hmm. try to counsel patients on, slowing things down a little bit, think, get them to think about knee scooters or eye walks or other ways to get around. I think uh, you know, slipping down the stairs one week post-op, even with a splint on, can lead to some disasters. So I think that's the other thing we really need to to think about. And and I usually try to send them to rehab early, even while they're in the splint. So again, they get the talk, they get some more crutch training. Um, it's uh, that can be a tough thing for these patients. There are a lot of things we can do in rehab early on too, working the intrinsic of the foot along with the proximal muscle musculature. I mean, you trained at Lenoxville Hospital. You know, James A. Nicholas is harping us about the B program: T to hip flexion, abduction, adduction. All mm -hmm. that will contribute to returning them to the field of play later on, um, for sure. Um, as with most articles with uh, with Achilles tendon, th this article had a very small sample size. They started with 31, 31 patients, and they wound up to 10 in each group, okay? And the the results here were equivocal. Um, the, out the functional outcomes were pretty much the same. They had one, one complication in each group. So... Um, I, I would like to see them break down whether whether the athletes um, whether there were how many athletes were in each group too. You know, yeah, you know it's hard to hard to tease out these differences. We know that they're pretty small, even though we talked about even if this was a not op versus op paper, we're talking about a you know, uh, you know five times difference. If it's a couple of percentage points. It's hard to tease out with this small sample size. Um, you know, I think uh, it's good to have the same surgeons doing the the procedure. Um, but I think th these are where the studies are right now for the uh, MIS uh, versus open. Um, mm -hmm. I think the uh, the study that we'd like to see is to to compare open versus a uh, MIS with a um, with a a uh, with Achilles anchors to see if we can load them a little bit earlier, see if we can get uh, weight bearing even a little bit earlier and and uh, be more comfortable um with that if there's less elongation clinically um i think those will will come soon and if you look and if you look at how how physical therapists can do harm to these repairs it's stretching out the repair i mean yeah. you, you don't allow us to stretch for close to 12 weeks and your philosophy is get dorsiflexion on their own as they increase their weight bearing they decrease their heel lifts they'll get it on their own there's no reason to stretch it because if you look at stretching out, I mean, essentially, that's what happened to Dan Marino and Vinny Testaverde. You know what? Their Achilles stretched out. Um, yeah. They lost power. They couldn't push off. We're hoping that Aaron doesn't have the same thing. I'm sure he won't because he's a jet, you know, and, uh, and he's going to yeah. win the Super Bowl this year. Yeah, so Aaron uh, Rady got back to a little bit of practice last year. And, you know, I think it was on less than 80 days post-op back to some practice. Yep. Uh, so, uh, but he was wearing his heel lift. Uh, you know, he, he's not uh, he's, he's not going, uh, you know, fast starts and stops. It's a little bit different when we say, hey, he got back to practice. But I think that that also gets in the minds of our patients. Hey, Aaron Rodgers is back practicing in December. He was ready to go. I want to be ready to go in three months. Um, and that's... Uh, that's not quite uh, what we're what we're usually uh, nobody, achieving nobody, or what's, nobody, what's possible. Nobody nobody was chasing them, Doctor Benford. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so what do you what do you tell your patients, uh, Tim, in terms of getting back to what, get back to play? What's the nine, what's the nine to twelve months? Yeah, and I think that's reasonable. That's uh, which is a lot longer than most of the things we do. Um, so that's a uh, that's a long time when they when they think about it in the beginning. But I think. Uh, you know, that's the case if you look at a guy like Kevin Durant, a pro basketball player, right? It took him 18 months to, to get back. Um, Correct. And he got back very successfully. He's doing great. But, uh, but that's, a, that's a long time. That's the, that's the rarity because a third of NFL players do not return to the playing field that have Achilles tendon repairs. One third. Mm -hmm. and, yep. and the two-thirds two that repair 
they're they're they get less playing time and their career is a little bit shorter than their age match controls. Um, yep. Yeah, so I think the one the ones that return uh, in general have ten to twenty percent less playing time, uh, shorter careers, even though they return. Um, even some of the success stories. You look at a guy like Cam Akers, right? He tours uh, tours Achilles. Uh, I think in, in July, and he was back for the playoffs. So five months post-op, I think he's the fastest guy to return to the NFL, but he returned five months, which is pretty incredible, um, and played through the playoffs in the Super Bowl. Uh, although, unfortunately, last year he tore his contralateral Achilles. So, uh, you know, that's uh, that's a big risk factor that we didn't that we didn't talk about necessarily. Um, you know, a contralateral uh, tear, you have to, have to worry about it. I don't know if there's a – do you have a way to – what do you guys uh, counsel your patients on in, in terms of prevention of Achilles? Uh, if you have a guy that's that's torn and he's finishing up rehab, going back to play, anything you can do to to help him on the other side? Well, the reason they had the Achilles rupture is so they could go back and tear the other one, right? <laughs> that's yep. why he had to repair it so he get back on the playing field. There you and go. I think, I, I think there's a a big misconception about how fast we can move, move these people and how fast we can get them back on the field. Yeah. Um, and I think that if you have an injury somewhere else, you'll, your body will adapt somewhere else. And maybe it's that adaptation that, um, that caused the other, the, uh, the other Achilles to tear. Certainly when, when a body's not back, you rehab the whole body, not just the Achilles. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's possible that his whole body was a rehab, Sim similar to a soccer player in England. Um, I forgot the fellow's name. Owen. Uh, his last name was Owen. Uh, Mal talks about him all the time, Doc, and says, "You know what? He tore his ACL because he broke his foot six months earlier or four months earlier, and he didn't rehab his whole body. Mm -hmm. So he didn't keep everything fit and ready to roll and strength and do his prevention stuff." And all of a sudden, he tears his ACL. So the body will take the path of least resistance, and you'll have selective adaptations based on on the uh, the sport you see. What's your thought? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's tough. I think in general, the the ideas that that we counsel our patients on are to you know start new activities slowly. So as we're getting back into basketball after this, hey, we have to ramp it up. Uh, it's the it's the patient that just starts something, gets back, and goes full go right away. I think the the idea of dynamic warm up like we do for other other sports, other things, uh, makes some sense. Getting the heart rate going, um, but uh, no matter what we do, that patient's a little bit more at risk. I think uh, some patients with tendinopathy, I think being aggressive in the treatment of their Achilles tendinopathy um, can be helpful through therapy and eccentrics and you know biologics. Lots of things we can do there. Again, not a huge risk factor for an Achilles blowout, but something we want to be be mindful of. Um, I think in, in terms of, uh, when you see a patient that we have post-op, uh, we have early tendon loading, early weight bearing, um, what kind of modalities are you guys doing with these, these patients? Are you doing stem with them or ultrasound or what's, what's indicated? What, what are they getting from going to the therapist, uh, versus, you know, following a PT protocol at home or online? I guess I get that question a lot from patients. Excellent. Um, Rob Shapiro, you want to chime in here? Sure. Yeah, I mean, as appropriate, modalities wise, as needed. Like anything else to get somebody to move, modalities are fine. Electric stem. I'm not an ultrasound person at all. I don't think I've touched one in, in that's my opinion, but in many years. So I think, you know, the idea of getting on, being able to get, making sure the scar has good mobility around it, and not necessarily the tendon stuff, but the tissue around it, so the myofascial part of it. Um, yeah, and that's the modality side of it. I don't think we use as much. I mean, maybe the clinics are using um, maybe BFR. You know, blood flow restrictions become a big thing now. We have one of the docs out by us who's, you know, every every Achilles patient gets. That's his study. It, everybody's doing BFR for those, you know, for his lower extremity patients, that type of. Yeah, what are you guys seeing with BFR? That's another thing that's uh, that's hot among patients as well. They're, they're asking for it. They want to know our perspective on it. And I think it's, you know, in, from what I've seen is uh, safe and beneficial. Um, is there a, you know, faster rehab with that? You tell them there's a certain percentage, you know, 10% faster, a certain yeah. gain that they're getting with that. Um, or, or what's your, uh, what's your thought process when you talk to patients about BFR? 
I think it's beneficial early on. I think that uh, we don't have enough evidence in the area of Achilles tendon repair to be advocates for it, but I can see it doing no harm whatsoever. Um, when you have sample sizes like ACL populations, it's much easier to study the benefits of it. And uh, and uh, but with Achilles tendon, the principles remain the same, you know. And I don't see any reason why we can't be using BFR in the Achilles. Certainly, uh, we'll use some some laser in the Achilles repair. We'll do some uh, a lot of manual therapy there, uh, and a lot of uh, and a lot of um, joint mobilization, if you will, of the of the ankle joint and the surrounding foot uh, joints too. Yeah, I think it's it's great for us when our patients are in early PT because you're you're helping us uh, keep an eye on the incisional healing. You're looking at the calf. You can uh, see signs of DVT, things like that. Um, that's another complication we didn't talk about, and with oh. uh, either non-op or operative. Um, you know, we put our patients usually on chemo prophylaxis uh, for DVT while they're mobilized for six weeks or so. Um, but that's something that, that's helpful. Um, so, and, and the scar massage that you talked about, there can be adhesions uh, between the peritina and the sub tissue. Um, and that's something that I think makes it makes a really big difference. Um, as patients are getting further along in the PT process where they you know, have to strengthen what seems like forever, um, how do you make that transition? Is there a, a, a timeline at three months, six months, or a point where you say, hey, come once a week or every other week? Or how do you like to manage your patients when, the, when it seems to them it's going on forever and insurance might be cutting down on recovered visits? Uh, what, what do we do there? It's a very difficult, a difficult question because everybody's insurance isn't the same. The Medicare mm -hmm. patient isn't the same as the, the private payer, which isn't the same as the workers' comp, which is not the same as the, you know, the, the, uh, the patient who pays out of pocket. So mm -hmm. um, I, I personally treat the patient, not the insurance that they have. So if it's, if, it's, um, if it's a patient that needs our services, I will, I will provide that and uh, I'll use the insurance. And if they run out of insurance, We'll tell them the the risks and the rewards of not continuing, but obviously we'll try to um, be reasonable and keep their keep their visits keep their visits um, at a reasonable amount. I will I will I'll try not to use up all those visits early. You know I'll try to I'll try to do um, use the visits when they're most effective. Similar to an ACL, where that first six weeks is paramount for an ACL to get mm -hmm. extension to get the quad going that stuff. Well, you got it um, in, in Achilles, that first two, three, four weeks isn't as important as the next six weeks. So um, when do you send your patient to physical therapy, Dr. Bedford, after an Achilles repair? So they got a prescription, uh, usually when we're booking surgery, they'll get a prescription for therapy. And we try to get them in for, for a post-operative visit within the first few days after surgery. And okay. uh, that's... You know, one usually one visit for a little bit of more crutch training, um, getting them moving around, and then usually they'll pause and they'll see see again at two weeks out when we take their splint off and get them in a boot so they're uh, open for movement. Yeah. Rob Shapiro, is that the same way that you treat those uh, those patients also? I would. I mean, the key point is education, teaching them where they should be. This is they don't. From experience, people will do too much if not or. Either way, like they do enough or not enough. So we, our job is also, besides treating, is to teach them where's the process. You know, we kind of have our pyramid way of thinking. Hey, you've gotten past strength is going to take six or eight weeks. We know that. Don't be frustrated by that. They're going to expect that during your rehab, you're going to hit this period that looks like nothing's happening, but your body is. And that's the part. That's when you get into trouble because you think you're great. You don't have enough strength yet. You don't have anything to have power, or elastic strength. So all of a sudden, know it's going to take time, and don't try to push it past. But the body's gonna, you know, the process. I think mm -hmm. that's huge because you know we call it no man's land. Three months is like, all right, yep. got range of motion. I'm starting to get strength, but I don't have no, I don't have any power. I don't have any elastic strength. I don't have any speed. Of course, we expect that because you haven't got the prerequisites. So it's hard. Yeah. Education, like Tim said, you're educating the patient, understand the process, and be part of it, as opposed to saying, you know, doctor said, I said, you said, but here's here's the, here's what it is. Here's how things happen understand that process and be part of that process, if that makes sense. Yeah. When, when do you guys think, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, to, to answer your question about when to do things, I think we rely on the basic science. 
and then we, we, we check the boxes going from, you know, full range of motion, plasticity within the Achilles tendon, isometrics, uh, maximum, again, gravity eliminated, gravity, um, gravity resisted, and then go to isotonics, contractor, the eccentric, eccentric, then plyometrics and developing power and, and uh, power and functional, functional power. So that's kind of a, a stepwise progression. Is there, is, is there any, is there any point where you would say, Hey, you know what? It's too early. Don't do that. I thought it was like 12 weeks. Is that still the time frame, or based on the basic science or is it um, another time frame? 12 weeks to, to start what? Say that again. To start. Uh, it's more aggressive, right? More aggressive. More stuff. aggressive strengthening, I'd say. Yeah. I usually I mean. I mean, I think that's that's very reasonable. I think 12 weeks in, in most patients, they've got uh, they're back to, you know, neutral plantar flexion and, right. and slightly beyond. They can uh, tolerate it. And that's a great time to load the tendon. I think the question that uh, you get from patients is when should I be able to single leg heel rise? Uh, they all come into the office wanting to do that. And uh, I think there's a lot of variability um in both our operative and non-operative patients with that and uh they sometimes get a little bit caught up in that but i think we generally see that anywhere from three months on the early side to more commonly five six months out um being able to really single like heel rise and uh then turn the corner in terms of faster gait and uh and feeling more comfortable with, uh, with mobility the worst thing is that patient comes in and they can't see single leg heel rise because they now have 30 degrees of dorsiflexion at 12 weeks right. and you know what there ain't nothing that i'm going to do to fix that and unless you're going to do another surgery i don't think you're going to fix that either and yeah so that that's the, that's the only time it's worrisome for me if they had a lot yes. of dorsal flexion other than that it's going to come um right. yeah it's a little bit different pace so a lot of factors that, that go into that um so not something that that we're really worried about just counseling patients I think that this 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 post-operative diagnosis and rotator cuffs are where I err on the side of total caution. Don't screw up the great work that you guys have done. So when you say time frames and stuff like that, I I move slowly with these patients for that reason. Mm -hmm. Do you do you guys see a difference in uh, operative versus non-operative treated patients with uh, with Achilles ruptures at the three month point? Is there a are they about the same? No, they're not the same. The non-operatives, the non-operatives are are much much behind the operatives. That's what I see as well. That's what uh, I see. Yeah, I think so, a lot of these studies with non-operative are comparing outcomes at six and twelve months, and they they can catch up. But I think where they are at three months, they've been a little slower to weight bear in general, um, not necessarily by design. Um, but that's generally what happens. And I think they're a little bit behind going into that. Mm -hmm. And, and the couple, the couple of coaches who I've seen that didn't want surgery, um, they had trouble for a year coaching, you know, mm -hmm. and then eventually, but they were never a hundred percent. They said that's subjective, but that's what they had. That's what they uh, told me. Rob, what's your experience with that? Between the non operatives? Yeah, I think they take a while. No, operative, I think there's so much. And healing process, we know it like three months. It's pretty strong, but it still has time for everything. They got to catch up. Right? They haven't done as much early. They can't do as much earlier on their rehab because of the, you know, letting it heal. At least you have it in the post op. You have some type of stability built in, right? They have nothing, so I think it takes longer time. Okay. Doctor Bedford, you're, you're now the you're now the team physician for the Giants. Daniel Jones tears his tears his Achilles tendon. Obviously, you're going to fix it, but how quickly are you going to let him go back to playing on the football field, Doctor Bedford? Yeah, so I think uh, he's going to have it fixed. We're still more reproducible. Uh, going back to play, uh, it's one that I don't think there's a, a huge advantage to having him go back like Aaron Rodgers is trying in three months. I think. Uh, we know the Achilles doesn't have normal elasticity at that point. We know it's not as strong as it will be at that point. We know the uh, muscle strength just really can't be all the way back. Um, so we, we can't really quantify the re-injury risk so well. Um, but I think uh, we have a you know six to nine month uh, return to play window and six months being pretty early. I think nine months is our 
our goal to get back. For most, uh, you know, most football players, that's that's going to work okay. It means they're going to miss the rest of their current season, and they're going to get back in training camp and and get to play the next season. Um, so I think that that fits at this point with a lot of our injuries. I think you know Kirk Cousins is undergoing that right right now, right? So he tore his Achilles, and yeah. and he's on track to do that. Hasn't been a huge rush. Wasn't a lot of press about you know trying to get back immediately. Um, and again, it's these guys in their in their mid thirties that that it happens to. Um, but no, we don't have good data to support early return to play. I'd be, no, uh, I wouldn't want to be that doc for the, for, uh, for, for that quarterback to come back and re-rupture. That's for sure. <laughs> no, we're not. No, we're not. Rob Shapiro and Don, do we have any questions from the audience before we, uh, let doc, Dr. Bedford go? I don't see anything in the chat. I have a quick question. When do, is internal bracing part of this process at all? Is it? You do internal bracing with yeah. So the so the, I may have said speed bridge vaccine before. Mid, mid substance internal brace is uh, uh, probably the the most uh, uh, contemporary uh, treatment that we have. So using this pars technique uh, or even open, um, but anchoring the uh, upper part of the tendon to the heel. And I think okay. that that okay. uh, mid substance internal brace we're attaching with suture anchors to the heel um, can potentially uh, help us with that that uh, problem of elongation. Um, I think the difficulty we can have with that is that there can be some heel pain from these anchors. Um, you know, there's a five percent uh, chance of of some heel discomfort. Usually, not a big deal, um, but that's the the main downside with that. And in that case, we're uh, doing a more uh, absorbable suture repair of just the ends to hold them in the in the right spot. But all the tension is going to the upper part of the Achilles, so less elongation at the repair site potentially. Um, that's what, uh, the technique that Aaron Rodgers had and, uh, and becoming more popular, I think that, and potentially loading it with, uh, biologics in the post-operative period, uh, or the, the things that are in vogue without a huge amount of data right now, but something that may make sense. I mean, if we think about these, uh, tendons that are, they're, they're tearing, uh, in their watershed area where we know blood supply isn't that great. Um, trying to stimulate them with, uh, with something to help them heal it makes sense. I think we need, again, some more data to be able to recommend that routinely. Okay. Yeah, I didn't realize that the speed, speed bridge was the internal brace. I always think of like the taping, you know, that type of. But Yeah, so you're right. The speed bridge we talked about for uh, avulsions from the calcaneus. Um, and uh, we use a set of four anchors to really control that footprint and put them down. Those almost always need to be uh, fixed surgically. Uh, for the mid substance ones using that internal brace, you know, a real internal brace we talk about is, uh, you know, to use the ligament that goes from bone to bone. So this is kind of a pseudo internal brace. We're taking tendon to bone, but right. that's the, uh, you know, the, the way we, we talk about it. Yeah. Thank you. I think, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Question. Question, question came in. Did you see it, Rob? I did. I have to put my glasses on. If you have yours on, do I have to do that? Let's see. Got to put my spectacles on there. They can make up smaller and smaller these things. Let's see. What, uh, was Cam Akers just a freak athlete who was able to return in five months? Or was there more going on in his recovery that wouldn't be available to everybody today? Yeah. So I think that's, uh, I don't have all the information on that. I think would be the bottom line. I, I believe he had a uh, minimally invasive repair, uh, like we've been talking about with a uh, internal brace. Um, and uh, I don't think, I don't know if he had any biologics, um, but he's definitely an, an outlier. There have been other guys that have returned at the you know, six, seven month point. Um, but I'm not sure we have a real answer. Anything we can do to enhance uh, you know, calf strength early would be helpful, but I, I don't know if he had any, any supplements or anything else he was, he was on. Yeah. Don't know the answer to that. I think the other question we sometimes get from uh, patients is about uh, risk factors related to fields. So turf uh, for Achilles or cleats or uh, things of that nature. I don't know if you guys have any perspective shaping uh, some ATCs or taking care of uh, athletes on the field um, and anything with, with that. I, in the literature, I don't think there's a difference, you know? Um, yeah, I think, I think they, you know, the more the foot can slide, the safer it is for most of these injuries. The planted foot creates most of the problems for Achilles and, and to lesser extent ACLs. Um, you know, so I think there's there's not good data on that. I think the, the newer field yeah. turf is is uh, much better than the older style turf where the cleats could really get stuck. 
Um, I think uh, the in the Aaron Rodgers injury, his his foot didn't move and he had a huge lineman on top of him, creating you know that force. If his foot was able to slide out, could it have you know prevented the injury? Yeah, maybe. I don't know if that's a turf issue or just a foot position issue. I think for uh, you know, Kirk Cousins was uh, talking about after his injury at Lambeau Field, they were really long spikes for Lambeau Field in particular. And, uh, you know, was that a, you know, longer spike issue where the foot couldn't move? So I think that's something that, you know, that athletic training and taking care of college for athletes, something you think about a little bit. I'm not sure what the, the right answer on that is, though. Okay. Well, one, one more question. Dan, Dan says, is there a concern over stressed, uh, stretch shielding with speed bridge? Yeah, so I think if... Uh, if we're using that uh, you know, internal brace uh, technique, uh, I think that concern is is there. However, probably less so in the Achilles than in, in something like an ACL. Um, I think we're having a lot of dynamic movement through the Achilles. Uh, we're uh, we have the tendon edges opposed, and uh, there's uh, there's shared load as we uh, as we start to elongate. Um, that we don't have. Uh, two fixed points so we're putting the sutures in. So the, the calcaneus to be the fixed point, but there's a lot of uh, dynam dynamic load through the proximal segment. So I think that's less likely a concern. Um, I think it's the shared load mechanism seems to be the reason. All right. Dr. Bedford, I can't thank you enough for joining us on the Sports Medicine Research Rundown tonight. And uh, I look forward to uh, Working with you is soon. Thank you. All right, we'll, we'll send you some more Achilles to rehab. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everybody. It. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.